Well, this past week, I posted an article to my website called uh, Congressional and Presidential Irresponsibility. And you can see that article in its entirety by going to my website, harrybrown.org, and right there on the home page is a link to it. Just scroll down one page and you'll see all the recent articles, uh, links to all the recent articles. But in any event, in that article, I talked about this uh, $388 billion spending bill that Congress passed uh, just a few days ago. What happens, of course, is that they shilly-shally around, they dilly-dally around, they willy-wally around for the entire year, and they argue about this, and they do that, and so forth and so on, and then suddenly it's December, and the new fiscal year is already two months old, and they haven't passed appropriations for all kinds of different departments and agencies, and so they have to roll all this into one omnibus spending bill. And when they do that, they print up the bill, throw everything in it that hasn't been appropriated, and pass it so that they can get home, celebrate Christmas with their loved ones. And, of course, we wouldn't want to prevent them from celebrating Christmas with their loved ones, even though it's their fault that it is so late in the year that they're getting around to this. But the interesting thing about their doing this, and believe me, believe me, this is not the first time it's happened. The interesting thing is that to put all that they need to into one bill and then print it out, the bill is 3,500 pages long, 3,500 pages long. Now, how long would you think that it would take for a congressman to, answer, to read that entire bill? Now, let me ask that question again, and I want an answer from you. How long would it take a congressman to read that entire bill? Do you have your answer? All right, I'm going to tell you now. It's a trick question. It's a trick question because no congressman ever reads a bill like that. All they do is they go into the House of uh, Representatives floor or the Senate floor and vote for it. And when they vote for it, they have no idea what they're voting for. All they know is if they don't pass this darn thing, they're not going to get home for Christmas. And so here they have this 3,500-page bill appropriating $388 billion of our money, and they don't have the faintest idea what they're voting for. Once the bill was passed, suddenly, suddenly, now, somebody discovers that there's a provision in the bill that allows the chairman of the House Appropriation Committee or the chairman of the Senate Appropriation Committee or anyone that they designate as their agent to have, quote, access to Internal Revenue Service facilities and any tax returns or return information contained therein, end of quote. In other words the chairman of the House or the chairman of the Senate Appropriation Committee or anyone that either of those worthy gentlemen designates can go snooping around in the IRS and read any tax return he wants. Yours, mine, George Bush's, Howard Dean's, anybody's. And suddenly, everybody's shocked. The congressmen are shocked. I didn't know that was in there. Nobody told me it was in there. I wouldn't have voted for that. Yeah, right. Well, why didn't you just not vote for the bill when you had no idea what was in it? My God, when you go to buy a car, do you let the car dealer or the car salesman say to you, we'll show you the car, we'll let you know what accessories are on the car, we'll tell you what color the car is, we'll tell you how much it costs after you give us the money for it? No, I don't think so. You know why? Because that would be their money being spent, not our money being spent. And so they would be very, 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 very careful with what that money was going for. So, of course, they're going to pass some retro bill to cancel out that provision. Well, when I was in New York last night to give a speech at the Foundation for Economic Education, a very, very worthy organization, I was handed a copy of the New York Sun, which is a new daily newspaper five days a week that is now in competition with the Times, the Post, and the, what's the other one there, Daily News in New York. And it's a very conservative paper. They're calling themselves the alternative to the New York Times, but... The kind of alternative I'd like to see is not one that is now so conservative and Republican that it's just as uh, throat-gagging as the New York Times is in its liberal applications. But I did look through the paper on the plane coming home, and there was a very interesting article by one John P. Avalon, and it's entitled, Wanted Wild Hog Control. And what's happened here is Mr. Avalon has apparently leaped through the bill, got a copy of it and leaped through it, or he had access to somebody else's research, but he named a number of other things that were in the bill. And here are some of the places where your money is going in this bill. There is $1 million appropriated for the, quote, Wild American Shrimp Initiative, unquote. 
well, that sounds worthy to me. I, I like shrimp, and I like especially like shrimp that show a lot of initiative. Uh, then there was $515,000 for brown tree snake management. Well, I think that's a good cause because obviously you don't want those brown tree snakes running loose. They've got to be managed. Uh, that's in Guam, incidentally. $150,000 for the therapeutic horseback riding program. Well, if it's therapeutic, it must be good. Obviously, it's something very good. And that's at the Lady Bee Ranch in California. There is $150,000 for fishing rationalization research in Alaska. Well, I'm not a fisherman, but I can only imagine that if I were a fisherman, the last thing I would want to do would be to be fishing for irrational fish. And so this is, seems to me is a very good uh, program. There's also 50, 50 grand for wild hog control in Missouri, hence the title of John Ablon's column. Then there's a group of programs that I think are very, very important. $4 million dollars for what Senator Shelby's office described as important research at an international fertilizer development center in Atlanta. Pardon me. Let's try that one again. $4 million for what a press release from Senator Shelby's office described as important research at an international fertilizer development center in in Alabama. $2.3 million for an animal waste management laboratory in Kentucky. $470,000 470000 for swine and other animal waste management research in North Carolina, and 268000 for livestock waste research in Iowa. Now, I guess you know what fertilizer and waste, re, uh, waste management, swine, livestock, wherever it comes from, is. We're talking here about a word that I can't give out on national radio, because like Howard Stern, I get my wrist left. There's also... $25,000 to develop a curriculum for the study of mariachi music in Nevada. Two million, well, I mean, if we're going to be nice to our Mexican friends, we've got to understand mariachi music. And I, for one, don't understand it at all. So this is obviously a valuable program. Two million dollars for an unelaborated kitchen relocation in Fairbanks, Alaska. 250000 to celebrate Alaskan statehood. And certainly we must be do that. If we don't do that, then we're racist because we're voting against the Eskimos. 99000 to train students in the motorsports industry. Yes, we need more race drivers. No question about it. $1.75 million for an organization known as Parents Anonymous. Oh, yes. Parents <clears throat> who are probably doing things to their children that they don't want us to know about. And I can well understand that. Well, it goes on and on with things like this. This is what they voted for. And, of course, not one congressman knows of any of these programs, could tell you what they are, could even tell you that they're in the bill, unless... You're talking about a program that he himself got inserted into the bill. And I'm sure there is pork there for every Republican and every Democrat in the House and every one of them in the Senate. And this is what they are doing with your money. Well, way back in 1995, I wrote a book called Why Government Doesn't Work. It was my campaign book for the 1996 election campaign when I ran as the Libertarian president. And I had a section in there about what a president could do. It was a chapter on this. And I said there, and I'm going to just simply quickly read this to you. Quote, one sign of a government run amok is that many congressional bills are hundreds and hundreds of pages long, and they include dozens and dozens of provisions that are irrelevant to the bill's topics. Congressmen rarely read the bills they vote for, and presidents almost never read them before signing them. Everyone relies on aides and experts to assess the bills, and even the latter can't read a bill that's rushed through to a vote or altered at the very last minute. In too many cases, congressmen and presidents don't even care what's in a bill. They approve it not because of its content, but because of its image. Tough on crime, racially correct, welfare reform, budget cutting, environmentally poor, or whatever. Now, this is the way that such things as quotas, asset forfeiture, draconian regulations, and so many other pernicious practices sneak into the law as minor matters, so-called, are hidden in a skyscraper of words. But after the bill's passage, the regulators read all the bills thoroughly and they enforce every single provision that's been sneakily put into the bill. And then some congressmen are shocked, 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 shocked to learn that their constituents are being harassed. If I were somehow elected president, I would not sign any bill that I have not read in its entirety. I would consult with advisors, but I would always make the final decision myself based on what a bill actually says and not just what its title is. If a bill is too long for me to read in the ten days that the Constitution gives the President to make a decision, then I would just simply veto it automatically rather than sign something I hadn't read and studied. 
If a bill is ambiguous or too complicated to understand, then I would veto it automatically, even if I thought that it might be aimed in the right direction. If these standards seem too rigid for this modern age, it is not because the standards are wrong, but because government has become too big and complicated. Restore government to a manageable size, and bills would be short. Life would be much less complicated, and Congress could do all of its work for a year in just a few weeks. End of quote. A man named Frank Chodorov, who wrote a book called The Income Tax, The Root of All Evil, oh, 60 years ago or so, once said that he wanted a government small enough to fit into his, into his kitchen. And, of course, with a government that small, we would have small spending bills with no surprise provisions. And while I sympathize with Mr. Shodorov wanting a government small enough to fit into his kitchen, I think it would be more appropriate to have a government that would fit into my bathroom. And James out in cyberspace, uh, I guess listening to this about congressmen voting for laws that they haven't read and so forth, said, I have noticed that Congress has a tendency to vote for laws that already exist. I've heard that the reason is that if they don't, then the law wouldn't exist anymore. Somehow I have a hard time believing this. Can you comment on this? Well, the only thing I can think of that you may be talking about is that there are some laws that have sunset provisions. A sunset provision means that the law is passed with an effective term of, say, five years. And at the end of that five years, the law will automatically expire and, in effect, be repealed unless Congress votes to extend it for another two centuries or whatever. And, of course, there are are very few laws that have sunset provisions, very few agencies that have sunset provisions. They should all be brought up to be reconsidered every two years at the most, but of course they shouldn't even exist in the first place because there is no authority in the Constitution for there to be agencies like the Food and Drug Administration or the Federal Trade Commission or the Securities and Exchange Commission and so on. But because they do exist, some of them have sunset provisions, but not, not the big agencies. In any event, the point is that that's what it is. Most laws don't have sunset provisions. They pass the law to provide for taking withholding out of everybody's paycheck and forwarding it to the federal government to apply to their income tax. Um, that law was passed during World War II as a temporary measure but it did not have a sunset provision, and so that temporary measure is still with us. And as a result, instead of people paying their taxes once a year, which was the way it was done for the first 30 years of the federal income tax, now people just settle up at the end of the year and see whether they owe a little more or have some coming back. Danny in Rock Hill, South Carolina, says, What do you think about libertarians running for office as Republicans, where they may have a better chance of getting elected? Hasn't this strategy worked well for Ron Paul? Well, Ron Paul has done very well as a Republican candidate, but I have to say that he's an extraordinary individual in an extraordinary situation. I think if you just stop and think about it and consider what would happen if you decided to run in the Republican primary in your con congressional district, do you think you would have any more chance of winning the primary and then winning the general election than you would running as a libertarian? I don't really think so. Because even if it was a, currently a Democratic district, meaning that a Democratic uh, office holder had that congressional seat, still the Republican establishment is going to have somebody running that they approve of, not some kook who wants to repeal the income tax and end the drug laws and pull Americans out of Iraq and so forth. They just don't like those things. Then they're going to put somebody in that race against you, and they're going to make sure that that somebody has got at least a few hundred thousand dollars, if not several million dollars, available to win that primary. So you fight pretty much the same uphill battle that you would as a libertarian. Ron Paul was first elected in the late 70s to a congressional district just outside of Houston. He was elected as a Republican, and he was very popular in the district. And in 1982, he, ran, he abandoned his seat to run in the Republican primary for the Senate because somebody had retired. I forget exactly what the situation is, but he ran in the primary against Bill Graham, who was a... Democrat turned Republican congressman who now wanted to move up to the Senate. And Graham won the primary, so Paul was pretty much out of it. He had given up his congressional seat, and he didn't win the Senate seat. So years went by. In 1988, he ran for the presidency as a libertarian, and in case you didn't hear, he didn't win. And he continued to stay out of Congress and was out of Congress in all for 14 years until 1996 when he decided to reseek the seat that he had once had. And by this time, the seat was held by a Republican who had just a few months before 
quit the Democratic Party and joined the Republican Party. So he was a renegade Democrat, now a Republican. And Paul ran against him in the Republican primary, and the Republican establishment did everything they could to defeat Ron Paul, but he still retained the, a great deal of popularity in the district, and people liked what he had to say, and he won the, uh, the Republican primary and went on to win the general election. Two years later, in 98, the Republicans put up another candidate against him, and he still managed to win. And now, in the year... 2004, he ran with no opposition whatsoever in the primary and no opposition whatsoever in the general election. He is that popular in that district. But as I said, that's an extraordinary situation. Now, maybe you could find another situation around the country where you have uh, what would seem to be a, a libertarian, sympathetic population in the district, and it might be in some way possible for somebody running on a libertarian set of proposals, principles, and platform to be able to defeat a Republican, but he'd have to raise a lot of money to do it because people wouldn't even know what he stood for unless he could run a great deal of advertising. So if you find such a uh, situation, I wouldn't argue with you if that's what you decided to do or decided to support or somebody else decided to do. As I've said so often, I will never stick my foot out and trip somebody who's trying to move in the same direction that I am. But on the whole, I don't think that it is a workable strategy. That doesn't mean that we're going to elect libertarians to office in two years as a libertarian uh, under the libertarian label, elect people to Congress, the Senate, uh, or even to the state legislature in any appreciable numbers. But the fact that we're not going to be able to do it with the libertarians doesn't mean we should not be able to do it with somebody else, meaning just because we can't do it as libertarians doesn't mean, I'm not going to, uh, doesn't mean that we should just run off and try something else, which doesn't seem to have much prospect of success either. So that's the way I feel about it, but others may feel differently. How do you feel about it? Give me a call at 1-800-259-9231, and uh, we'll go over some other things, and we'll find out what's going on in the world. Bob in Cyberspace says, Would it be possible for you to post the list of the few spending items you noted on your Radio Links page? I would love to forward those to my congressman. I did post a link to the article, but the New York Sun requires that you subscribe, and the cheapest subscription is something like $15 for three months. They're um, a new newspaper, and I think that's the way they're hoping to be able to recoup their investment. So it costs you to get to the original. I will write an article and quote Mr. Avalon's uh, items that he has come up with in his research, and that will probably be on my website within the next two or three days. All right, let's see what's happening out in the real world. Uh, let's talk first with Chuck in California. Good evening, Chuck. Hi, oh, Eric. There's something that I wanted you to touch on. Uh, I've been recently reminded about what a wonderful president Clinton was because of a supposed budget surplus that uh, he had a couple of three years. I'd like for you to talk briefly about the the supposed government surplus during his sure. during his presidency. Uh, it was a fraud, not surprisingly, coming from those great politicians. Uh, no. Polit fraud? <laughs> Politician? No. Go on. What happened was that he uh, that it wasn't Clinton that did this. This is the years and years ago, back uh, when Richard Nixon was president. They put through a new method of accounting, uh, one that would make Enron proud, and that is that instead of keeping the Social Security budget as a separate budget from the general budget, and just looking at Social Security re receipts and expenditures and whatever the excess of receipts over expenditures was would go into the uh, Social Security Trust Fund, suppose. They instead combined it with all the other expenditures for the military and for foreign aid and uh, aid education and all that stuff. And so now you have one big budget. And as a result, the Social Security money was just mixed in with everything else. So what has happened is that we have reached the point where uh, they are just simply stealing the money from Social Security. They keep telling us the Social Security Trust Fund is safe and this, that, and the other thing, but they're stealing the money from Social Security to make up for the deficits or to whatever extent they can make up the deficits in the general fund. And it finally reached the point where the deficit had been reduced enough that stealing the excess of Social Security receipts was enough to make it look like there were surpluses in the overall budget. But in fact, there was still a deficit being run because they were just stealing the money from Social Security and replacing what they had stolen with IOUs from the federal government. And if you, that means they were borrowing the money from Social Security. And when you are borrowing money to make up, uh, to balance the budget, you don't have a balanced budget. You have a deficit. Just like in California, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger solved the great budget crisis where there was a great deficit in California, he solved it by borrowing money, which, of course, makes no sense whatsoever. Anyway, am I making myself clear on this? Yes, you did. I just wonder if that, uh, if that situation where the increase in the Social Security income offset it enough to where they could brag about having a surplus, was that precipitated by baby boomers getting into their senior years where they're making the most money? Uh, well, there has been a, a 
surplus in Social Security revenues for many, many, many years. This, this has been going on for decades. The problem is that the surplus is not enough to cover, uh, to create a trust fund large enough to have provided for all that they are going to have to pay out at some time in the future. And when they start uh, paying out to the baby boomers and others, as, as others have pointed out already, it's going to be an ex a really rough situation, and they are going to have to raise the Social Security tax. Well, that what was it that, that Clinton did if, if the same accounting practice was in place when Bush Sr. was there, and Clinton was there, and Bush Jr. was there, why did they only show a surplus during the Clinton years? Because the actual deficit was less during those Clinton years than it was in the two Bush terms. Why, because he spent less money? No, but uh, the economy was doing well enough to provide the revenue, and, okay. and he was, and uh, actually the answer to your question in one sense is yes, in that the budget was not growing as fast during the Clinton years as it was during Bush Sr.'s years and Bush Jr.'s years. They are, in effect, bigger spenders than Clinton was. The budget was growing. They were spending more money every year, but the growth was not as steep as it has been under Republican administrations. Okay, I think you covered it. Okay. Thanks, Thanks for calling, Chuck. And uh, Chuck asked about the apparent surpluses in the Clinton administration, and I pointed out that they, they seemed to reach that point where there was apparent surpluses only because government wasn't growing as fast under the Clinton administration as it was under the two Bush administrations. And part of the reason for that is that the Republicans could openly criticize the programs that Clinton was proposing. But a Republican Congress cannot openly criticize what George W. Bush is doing. And because the Democrats had control of Congress during the first Bush administration, uh, Bush Sr., and because George Bush Sr. did not veto many programs, uh, spending increased faster then. But referring back once again to John P. Ablon's article from which I got all of those examples of spending in the omnibus spending bill, he says, the fact is that if you compare government spending from the Clinton years to the current Bush administration and its Congress, the Democrats can now convincingly claim to be the party of fiscal responsibility. Now, understand, this is coming from a columnist in a very right-wing New York newspaper. And when I say a very right-wing, I'm basing that on the study of one issue, and especially the editorial page and the columnists that they have on that editorial page. It seems to me that everybody is either center-right or right-right or right-right-right-right. That is writing for the New York Sun in the commentary section. So I'm assuming that John P. Avalon is a pretty strong Republican, but he, too, is fed up with what the Republican Congress has done, not just in the spending bill, but in all the spending that they have been doing over the last four years with Bush in the White House. And as you probably know already, George W. Bush has not vetoed a single bill so far. And with the rampant uh, spending, with the rampant increases in the government budget, uh, anybody who claimed to be a conservative, compassionate or otherwise, would be vetoing bills. And George Bush is not doing that. And you can say that it's military spending that has been required in order to make the budget increase, but the fact of the matter is that when you have a family emergency, uh, you have to cut somewhere else to provide for the funds for that emergency. And George W. Bush, if he really is waging this war on terror, honestly, would have to admit that he's got to cut someplace else in the budget. That is, if he is fiscally conservative. Oh, that's right, he's not fiscally conservative, so he isn't cutting anywhere else, and he's not vetoing any bills, and government is growing at a rapid rate. Uh, did you listen to the news? You should have. There were some really juicy items in there. George Bush praised Perez Musharraf, the dictator of Pakistan, as a partner in the war on terror, as he has done so many times before, and Musharraf is now visiting Bush, and they met in the Oval Office of the White House, I guess it was today. And, of course, Musharraf has, you know, declared martial law in Pakistan, and he's probably dictator for life if he hasn't so called himself that. He is probably in effect, if not in name. And this is the kind of people that our government has been associating with, not just for the last three years, but for the last 65 years since at least 1941, and probably even earlier than that. The United States uh, consorted with Joseph Stalin, sent him billions and billions of dollars of money and materials during the Second World War, and even after the war for a little while, and of course supported dictators in Indonesia and South Vietnam and South Korea, and a lot of African dictators and various Pakistani dictators, and today Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan dictators, and I know I'm uh, leaving out a lot of Chiang Kai-shek, 
uh, God, the billions of dollars that went to him with a very corrupt and very, very repressive regime there. And you can just go around the world with this and see all of these different places where the United States has supported these dictators. They were our partners in the war on communism. They are our partners in the war on terror. And the next thing you know, they turn out to be our enemies, like Saddam Hussein, who was our partner in trying to bring down the government of Iran back in the 1980s. So... Nothing ever seems to change. Another big item in the news was John McCain said that Major League Baseball has one month to come up with a solid policy to outlaw steroid use. And what happens if they don't come up with that in one month? Well, then he will see to it that a law gets passed that will force them to abide by a policy set by Congress. So, of course, with a gun to their head, the high mucky mucks of Major League Baseball will come up with a steroid policy and everybody will call it a voluntary gesture on the part of Major League Baseball. There's no law saying they had to do it, but they did it anyway. Of course, if they hadn't done it, a law would have been passed, but that will be forgotten in a month or two after that. Well, let's now travel out to Nevada and talk with Mark. Good evening, Mark. Hey, sir. How are you doing? Just fine. What's on your mind tonight? Uh, um, so this is the first time I've uh, caught your program since you've been with DCN, and mm -hmm. kind of excited about the fact that you're over on DCN. I've been a uh, long-time DCN listener. Uh, okay. um, Good. Uh, I know you're talking about uh, how unfeasible it is for uh, outsiders, Mavericks, to, to run for some of these partisan uh, offices. And uh, one thing, I believe it's you that have said this in the past, and you're absolutely right on this. You've uh, said in the past that, that we do not naturally be a, a two-party system, that uh, we are a two-party system today as a result of uh, state uh, intervention. Sure. And I ran for city council up in Minnesota. I, I'm not sure if you can tell, pursuant to my accent, that's where I'm from originally, but I actually ran for city council. Uh, which, of course, it was a nonpartisan race uh, in uh, Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, actually did pretty well. And as I was looking at some of these campaign laws, and like when it comes to the partisan races for, say, you know, i.e., the state legislature, uh, Congress, you know, federal offices, and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, contrasted with a nonpartisan race such as city council, uh, it really occurred to me that you're absolutely right. Because, in fact, I think I can explain a, a huge paradox uh, with some of these ballot access laws, like in Minnesota, for example, uh, the way that uh, it works is... Uh, if, if a candidate running with a certain party gets at least 5% of the vote, uh, a candidate who's running for a statewide office gets at least 5% of the vote, they will retain that party, will retain ballot access uh, for the next uh, election cycle. So say somebody running for a governor or a U.S. Senate, in fact, uh, oh, I'll just use an illustration here, say there is a Republican running for the U.S. Senate, and he garners, say, 35% of the vote, but he loses. The Republican Party would then have ballot access for the race two years later. Sure. Uh, any Republican candidate in that race. But now think about this now. Oh, oh you're saying any, any Republican candidate anywhere on the ticket? Yes. I see. In Minnesota is going to, because the Republican Party, a candidate in the Republican Party, ran for a statewide office and got at least 5% of the vote. So, so only, only, one, only one candidate has to do it to, to make the whole party uh, happen. Exactly. So, so think about it. Suppose that somebody is running for the U.S. Senate with the Republican Party, and uh, he, they get 35% of the vote, and they lose, and then they get fed up with the Republican Party, and they decide to switch to, say, the Libertarian Party or the Constitution Party, and run for governor two years later, uh, they themselves will not have ballot access as a Constitution Party candidate or a Libertarian Party candidate, but their Republican opponent would because of the 35% of the vote that they got two years earlier. Right. And so clearly these laws are set up to favor uh, you know, just Republicans and Democrats. Right. Well, that would seem to be an argument in favor of what the person who wrote in a little while ago in the last hour saying, what about having Libertarians run as Republicans? Because in the state of Minnesota, for instance, he would, if he could win the primary, he'd have automatic ballot status. Well, I like the idea of making all races nonpartisan, the way most municipal. Uh, races are done so that everybody has to go through the same standards uh, and, and meet the same criteria, and they can't discriminate. Well, if they were all nonpartisan, then the party system would crumble. Uh, the, they well, would... I mean, no, because, like, for example, I was actually libertarian endorsed when I ran for city council. Mm -hmm. So, but, but the thing is, uh, for all practical purposes, the way that the parties have, uh, uh, the way it is right now, you're right, that the party system, the present system, would crumble. In other words, uh, you could be a member of the hair club for men, you know, as opposed to Republican, and that's not going to make a dime sort of difference sure. when it comes to how you're going to get on that ballot. And actually, I like that idea. Uh, but, uh, uh, I, cause presently, you know, it's, if you're a Republican or a Democrat, then you are, you have an automatic advantage. And really, I see that as state sponsored uh, discrimination. Yes, well, I think the answer to it is to try to eliminate the discrimination wherever possible, and it has been eliminated in some cases, such as in Florida, where they passed an initiative that got rid of the very, very discriminatory ballot access situation there. Uh, but they had to go over the heads of the legislature and do it in an initiative that would be voted on by the people. But I would like to keep the party system because I would like people to be identified as libertarians. And we continue to do outreach through radio and television and organizations like Downsize DC and the Libertarian Party and build name recognition for the libertarian label. We want people to know who are the small government candidates because 
you're, you're going to find that the average person walking into the, the uh, voting booth has no idea who any of these people are. They're all foreign names to him. Uh, he has no knowledge who this person running for the state legislature is, and we want to build eventually the, to the point where people say, ah, a libertarian, I'm going to vote for him because he's going to be for smaller government. So thanks for your thoughts, though, Mark. I appreciate it. And let's talk now with Jan in Colorado. Good evening, Jan. Good evening. What's I up? Think, oh, I think that uh, you may have advanced my understanding of the fiscal security situation a little bit with your discussion last hour. I wanted to uh, try to clarify a little bit more. Sure. Uh, so before Nixon changed the rules, uh, was there a, a uh, Social Security trust fund? Yes, and there still is, supposedly, but the trust fund is full of IOUs. It always has been full of IOUs, uh, but <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is it's full of more IOUs now than ever. And, well, every year it has increased the number of IOUs, but it's really a case of bookkeeping. Before, they knew how much the deficit was in the general fund. Now we don't know unless we go into the numbers and dig them out, and you can get those numbers. There's a website, government website, Economic Indicators. It's a monthly publication they put out in hard copy, but they also have it on the Internet, and I will make a note to put the link to that up there. You can go there free and get information, and if you find the right um, table in there, and I'll steer you to the right table, you can see exactly how much uh, Social Security receipts exceeded uh, Social Security expenditures, and you know that that amount needs to be added to whatever they're saying the deficit is in order to know what the real deficit is, because if they were not letting that get mixed in with the general fund, uh, they would have a bigger deficit. But what they're doing is they're issuing IOUs in exchange for getting the money from uh, the Social Security Trust Fund and calling that income, calling it revenue. Well, if they issue IOUs to Bank of America in the form of bonds, they don't call that income when they get the money from Bank of America for those bonds that they issued, uh, government, treasury bonds that Bank of America was so kind to buy and other people were so generous in buying. But they, when they issue IOUs to the Social Security Trust Fund, they consider the money they get back from Social Security then to be income to the government. And it obviously isn't. And as I said, uh, Enron would be proud of somebody who developed this kind of an accounting system. How am I doing? How am I doing? Am I making this clear? I, as I say all this, I, I know exactly what I mean, but I'm not all that sure that I'm making it clear to anybody else. It is, it is uh, definitely hard to, to track. Uh, but, so all along, uh, before and after uh, the, the change of rules, you had uh, get money coming in from uh, from our paychecks uh, going into the, the this uh, trust fund, and it was also uh, being paid out. Money was being paid out to retirees, mm -hmm. uh, and the up, up till now, it, it sounds like. They've, uh, they've increased taxes as necessary, so that there's always been uh, more, more money coming in than has been paid out. Is that, is that right? Uh, yes, there has been uh, a surplus year after year, and I don't know what the current uh, projected year is now that the expenditures are going to start out running the surplus, uh, but from that point on, then the surplus is going to deplete it year after year. But let me put it this way. There has always been a surplus, as I said, but and always that's the surplus then has added to the trust fund. Now, what do they do with that trust fund? Well, they don't just have a whole bunch of dollar bills or $100 bills or $1,000 bills piled up in the corner of the Social Security office somewhere, and they don't have them in a bank vault somewhere, and they don't have them in a bank, and they don't have them invested in stocks. What have they done with this surplus? Well, how have they used that surplus? Well, they have always, from the beginning, used that surplus to buy U.S. Treasury bonds because U.S. Treasury bonds are considered the safest in terms of credit risk of any kind of bonds available in the market, and they are the safest in terms of credit risk. So that's always been the, been the case. But they have recognized that the fact that when they buy a bond from the government, that does not constitute income to the government. That's a loan to the government to cover the government's deficits, of either the current year or previous years or whatever. And it was always recognized that the government was borrowing this money uh, and using it to cover its deficits. Too. That, that's before Nixon. Right. But then once with the Nixon change in the accounting system, they now pretend that when they issue these treasury bonds that are bought by the Social Security Administration, whereby the Social Security Administration gives them its surplus and buys bonds with it, they now pretend that this money coming from the Social Security Administration is really revenue to the government, offsetting the government's expenditures, and in the case of those few Clinton years, uh, totaling up to a government surplus. <laughs> and, and maybe by my explaining it that way, it might be a little clearer. Okay, so, uh, so when I... Uh a uh, hundred thousand dollar mortgage. That was uh, that was income. It was not a was yeah, loan. Absolutely, that's exactly right. Uh, <laughs> by by the government's uh, bookkeeping system of the last thirty years. Okay. Okay. So I got another question. The money that they're taking in for Social Security, they need to invest that so that uh, when when people reach retirement age, they can they can they'll have money available to pay them back. Right. Now it's it's been said that uh, they're not taking in enough money to create investments that will be able to pay back the retirees. No question about that. All right. Now what is the would there be a difference in effect? on the economy 
if they if they did take in enough to if they if they did cover the uh, the, the future uh, demands. Uh, the difference would be yes, but it would be indirect. The direct difference would be on the federal budget, uh, in that huge tax increases will be necessary somewhere along the line, and those tax increases will either be an increase in the Social Security tax or an increase in the general income tax, which will then be used to subsidize Social Security. But either way, the drain on the economy of having higher taxes would be a negative effect on the economy, as any uh, tax increase is. And it isn't just a higher tax increase. It's the fact that there's higher spending involved, uh, higher outgoes of the federal government, because it's really the spending that counts. Uh, when Bush lowers taxes, it's just a bookkeeping trick, because the government is still drawing resources out of the economy. And when it does that, those resources are not available to us. And we notice it in higher prices or in uh, the unavailability of products or in other sub ways that we don't attribute to what's going on in Washington and the spending in Washington, but that's where these uh, uh, dislocations in the economy are originating, is with higher spending. So just lowering taxes does not change anything. It just rearranges the burden of big government. Yeah, I understand that. So uh, the, the difference would be uh, between covering by taking in enough money as you go versus uh, waiting until the last minute to uh, tax it. Well, as far as Social Security is concerned, yes, uh, but in order to allow for what they're promising to people, we probably need a Social Security tax now of 25 or 30 percent instead of 15 percent. And someday it may be that, and that is what it is in Italy and Belgium and a number of European countries today. It already is that high in many of those countries. Jan, thanks so much for your call. And we have a message from Jeff. says, would a libertarian running for the Democratic nomination have better luck than if he or she were to run as a Republican? A lot of libertarians seem to think the Republican Party more closely matches their views, but I just don't see it. Well, no, I don't know that there would be uh, any difference between running as a Republican or a Democrat. In either case, the party machinery would go into action to keep a libertarian from getting the primary uh, victory. And as for people saying that the Republicans more closely match the libertarians, that probably was true 30 years ago or more, but it has become less and less so. Both parties are really shams, both of the major parties. The Democrats claim to be for civil liberties, but they vote to censor the Internet. They vote to put a V-chip in your television set. They claim to be for peace, but they vote to go into Iraq and kill a bunch of people. They vote to be for personal morality and so on, people making their own personal decisions, but they go along with all of the Republican votes because they think they have to. And on the other side, the Republicans claim to be for uh, smaller government, but they vote to send money to foreign dictators, and uh, as we have seen, they will vote for anything that anybody thinks is a good idea. And so... Neither party lives up to its one-time reputation. That reputation remains, but it gets weaker year after year in both cases. And all they are are interested in power, and big government gives them that power, and so they are not going to be very supportive of anybody who tries to get a nomination in their party primary anywhere, not somebody who is outright for smaller government. And Jonathan Traeger, who used to work for the Libertarian Party, sent me a question, and I give his last name. I hope he doesn't mind, because I've got to tell you a little story about Jonathan Traeger. Today I arrived home from being in New York. I flew there yesterday, spoke at the Foundation for Economic Education last night, and flew back this morning, had to get up early to do so. And when I got home, I had not had much sleep last night or the night before, so before going into my office, I had decided to just sit in the living room, turn on the television, and let myself doze off a little if I felt so. And in surfing through to see something to put me to sleep. I came across a movie, and I forget why I stopped there for a, a couple of minutes, but it was a movie with John Cusack, and I have no idea what the name was. I never did find out, but I was just about to drowse off to sleep when suddenly I hear this woman say, uh, on a telephone saying, I want the address of Jonathan Traeger in New York. And I came bolt up uh, awake, and then I hear over and over again, yes, Jonathan Traeger, that's right, Jonathan Traeger. And I wonder if Jonathan Traeger has ever seen that movie. Um, and just uh, because you're on pins and needles wanting to know the end of the story, yes, I did eventually fall asleep. Jonathan does write, though, and say, Murray Sabrin is a great example of why libertarians running for office as Republicans won't work. In 1997, Sabrin was a libertarian candidate for governor of New Jersey and won 5% of the vote in the general election. He then left the Libertarian Party for the Republican Party. In 2000, he sought the Republican nomination for U.S. Senate on a libertarian platform. The GOP chairman at the time publicly denounced Sabrin and his outlandish ideas in the party machine back one of Sabrin's challengers. Not surprisingly, Sabrin was clobbered in the primary election. Ron Paul is the exception to the rule. If many libertarians tried to imitate him, virtually all of them would meet with the same fate that Sabrin did. Well, I'd have to say that I think uh, Jonathan is absolutely right. Uh, I look back at the election last month, and I keep hearing that what won for George Bush was his stand on moral values and people coming out to vote because they were encouraged to do so by the churches and the Bible Belt and so forth. And I really doubt that the 
that was the case, that they got more votes out of the uh, morally inclined people than they had before. But whatever the case, there is no question that we certainly do not want politicians making moral decisions for us and enforcing those with coercion, with putting guns to people's head to make them obey. In the first place, if you ask politicians to impose morality, then moral questions are going to be decided by whoever has the most political power. And that is never going to be you and it's never going to be me. And so if you give the government the power to implement God's law, Someone else is going to use it next year to implement the devil's law. And you're not going to be able to do anything to stop them. And you just have to ask yourself, if you're going to impose, uh, if you're going to use government to impose morality on people, what you're doing is you're asking Teddy Kennedy, uh, Trent Lott, people like Bill Clinton, George Bush, uh, Bill Frist, uh, Jesse Helms, uh, Charles Schumer, you're asking people of this ilk to decide moral questions and impose by coercion standards on all of us. And I don't know about you, but I don't consider those people to be moral paragons. And I certainly would not make them role models for my children. And I certainly then do not want them to have the power to enforce their way on everybody else. And, you know, if you carry it to its logical conclusion, why in the world would we even think of asking politicians to provide moral guidance for the country? Every one of them, Ron Paul perhaps accepted, every one of them at one time or another has sold his vote, sold his alleged principles in exchange for political, personal, or financial gain. And politicians pander as shamelessly as any streetwalker. Why in the world would we want them setting moral values for the country? And the result, of course, is that when you ask the government to impose your values upon others, you wind up with the government imposing someone else's values on you. So it comes down to the fact that you have two choices available to you. Try to use the government to force your values on other people or take away from the government the power to impose anyone's values. Because if you try to use the government, the next bad administration will then force alien values upon you. But if you take away such power from government once and for all, you no longer have to worry about politics. You can live your life in peace and raise your children by your values, not somebody else's. David in Minneapolis says, I've been hearing a lot of talk lately about amending the Constitution to allow persons not born in the U.S. to be president. The proponents of this seem to be focused on letting Arnold Schwarzenegger run for president. What are your thoughts on this issue, aside from Arnold being too liberal for our tastes? I haven't really thought through the general issue of a country letting a foreign-born person be the head of government. All I know about this subject is that Russia once had a head of government who was from Georgia, and that Germany once had a head of government who was from Austria. Bad things happen both times. Of course, David is referring to that fellow from Georgia named Joseph Stalin. And no, he's not talking about Atlanta. He's talking about Georgia, which was one of the Soviet republics. And he wound up as the dictator of Russia, as you know. And the fellow from Austria, who became the head of government in Germany, was a guy named Adolf Hitler. And a friend of mine once said that the Austrians are so smart that they have allowed the world to think that Beethoven was an Austrian and that Hitler was a German when the opposite was true in both cases. Now, as to amending the Constitution, of course, I think it is a bad idea ever to amend the Constitution because of a current situation. Uh, In other words, the idea that if we amend the Constitution, it will satisfy some current need. And the current need in this case, of course, is perceived by some people as being, we've got to get Arnold eligible to run for president. Why in the world people think Arnold would make a good president is beyond me. This movement started even before he was elected governor of California. Well, of course, I know the answer to my own question, and that is that this movement is by a bunch of Republicans who think that Arnold Schwarzenegger will appeal to a lot of young people and other people and that he would be a big vote-getter as a candidate, even if he might have policies in office that are contrary to one's principles. Who cares? The whole idea is to get a Republican elected president. So, obviously... Uh, they are doing this merely to get a Republican president in 2008 or 2012. Now, as to the question itself, whether a foreign-born person should be eligible to run for president, I see nothing wrong with that, provided the person has been in this country for a long, long time. And there is a proposal afoot. Actually, there are several proposals of this kind afoot right now. And one of them is that a foreign-born person could run for president if he had been a resident of the United States or a citizen of the United States for 20 years. Uh, In other words, somebody can't come here, become a citizen as quickly as possible, and then run for president. And that would perhaps keep out somebody who was doing it for ulterior motives. Hmm, What would an ulterior motive be? Trying to get government power? Hmm, That would rule out a lot of people, wouldn't it? Well, anyway, you get the point. In other words, we don't have to be afraid that some Manchurian candidate, as they're calling it, as the saying goes, would be sent over here to run for president and then turn the country over to China or something of that sort. And the length of time might be 20 years uh, 
whatever, but it shouldn't be a year or five years. It should be a healthy stretch of time. And of course, that would leave Arnold Schwarzenegger out. Uh, he's already in his late 50s, I believe, or mid to late 50s. And I don't think that there's any chance in the world that the Constitution is going to be amended under any circumstances, so it's not something we really have to concern ourselves about. And uh, what I spent the first half hour or so on oh, were the various yeah. things that were in that yeah, ominous, ominous, <laughs> the ominous spending bill uh, that Congress passed this last week. And, of course, all those ridiculous items are just a small sample oh, of what Congress is doing all year round. Nope. No, uh, As I've said before, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, so ridiculous that we could say that no congressman Perfect. would dare get up on the all floor right. of the all House right, or the Senate it. and propose it as to being a brand new law that ought to be enacted. I mean, there is nothing outside the reach of Congress now. And the whole concept of limited government has been thrown out the window. We don't have a constitution. When it says Congress shall make no law, the Supreme Court decides, well, uh, does that mean Congress shall make no law unless Congress thinks there ought to be a law made? And then they debate that within their robed exteriors for a good long time and finally render a decision. And when it says in the Ninth Amendment that the rights not ceded to the federal government by this document called the Constitution remain the rights of all Americans and all people in the United States, then that doesn't mean anything to Congress. So they'll take your rights away from you, your rights to privacy, your right to be safe from search and seizure, or what any kind of right, your right to privacy, because it doesn't even have to be mentioned in the Constitution. It says there that if the right hasn't been ceded to the government, it still remains with the people. But they will take them away anyway. And where it says in the Tenth Amendment that nothing that hasn't been authorized in this Constitution can be done by the federal government, they ignore that completely. George Bush, of course, says he believes in limited government, meaning limited to whatever he wants it to be. But, as I've said so often, and I know I sound like a broken record, it's going to be a good week this week coming week. At least it will be if you devote yourself to yourself and your family. You weren't put here to save the world. I hope you find it amusing, entertaining, enlightening, challenging, whatever, to spend a little time and some of your resources to try to advance the cause of liberty, to show other people the blessings of liberty. But don't let it consume you. Don't let it take over your life and don't let it depress you. Take advantage of every bit of freedom that you still have and make the most of your life. Oh, and one other thing you've got to do is to come back here next Saturday night. Thanks so much. This is Harry Brown. Bye-bye.